Well, good morning everybody. Um, as you can see, I've had a haircut. I bet many of you have had the same kind of experience last week. Um, and it's so good to feel shorn. <laughs> um, ben shared with us last week. Uh, it's my privilege to share with us this week about uh, finance and giving. Uh, my take today is going to focus more upon the inner workings of our heart, not unlike what Ben talked about, but actually focusing more on the life of the spirit as it pertains to giving. Uh, a friend of mine uh, was once given an anonymous gift of $1.2 million. God spoke to him and advised him that it was a prompt for him to ask for more. He said, what kind of more? He said, my manifest presence. One uh, at my old college at 4.55 p.m. on the last Friday before Christmas, a man walked into the reception and he said, I wonder if you could give me a tour and tell me what the college does. And this receptionist took half an hour, walked around, showed the man the whole place. And on the following Monday, the man sent a check for a million dollars. He said, I understood the culture of the place because of the way that the receptionist showed me around. I asked once for a pair of blue suede Adidas Sambas. Now, I don't know if you even know what an Adidas Samba is, but it's like that pair of trainers that I used to wear when I was a teenager. And about, I don't know, maybe eight, nine years ago, I decided I wanted another pair because it was my midlife crisis and I couldn't afford a motorbike. So what I asked, I asked guys, I said, look, I'd be crazy. I don't even know if I even asked. I just kind of just thought it. The following week, a bag of shoes arrived in our, living, uh, in our hallway that were secondhand shoes that were given from somebody else in the church for our Dan. But right at the bottom of this bag of shoes was a pair of Adidas Sambas, blue suede, hardly worn, which were too small for Dan, but were my perfect size. It was like God heard me even before I'd asked. I then prayed for, you know, emboldened, I began to pray for an, an iPad. I just thought it'd be really helpful when I'm preaching to have an iPad, just to get your notes on. That's what I said anyway. And uh, about a week later, Seven Trent rang me up and said, you've won. I said, what have I won? He said, your name has been picked out at random from our 4.5 million uh, customers, and you've won an iPad. You guessed it. And then finally, in, uh, when uh, Helen and I and the family lived in New Zealand, we were having some renovations on our house, and the renovations over overstretched by 10,000 New Zealand dollars which we didn't have, and we prayed and asked God to help us. We got a message from a couple who were Christians who said, look, we were praying, we heard God speak to us. Do you need $10,000? Because we feel like God spoke to us and told us to give it to you. I said, yes, we do. And we handed it on. All, all very interesting, you might say. And uh, what's the deal? Well, the deal is two things strike me out of these examples. One. God is the generous giver. He's never outdone in generosity. After all, remember, he gave his son, he gave us the spirit, he gave both for the world and for the saints of the church. He gives his very self on our behalf each day. Second, he, again, to re-emphasize, he gives the spirit and the spirit speaks to his listening people. I emphasize listening because I think the spirit wants to speak more, but sometimes we're not listening. And he gives gifts of faith and descent and loving kindness in endless supply. So from the beginning of this talk today, I want to remind you that a generous community, a generous person is one that gives this Holy Spirit room to move because God, the Holy Spirit, is a generous giver. Let me be clear. Less room for the Spirit, less generosity. More room for the Spirit? Guess what? More generosity. Don't misunderstand me. I'm aware that when the Spirit moves, all kinds of things can start happening. Given free reign in the community, gifts start uh, manifesting. Evidence in terms of healing, deliverance, faith, discernment, and the other tongues, interpretation, wisdom. All kinds of gifts start flowing. There's the nine part fruit also of the Spirit, and it grows and becomes visible. Love, joy, peace, kindness. All of these fruit of the Spirit are evidence that something's going on. Because the word fruit in Greek is 
means as a result of something. As a result of something. The fruit is there as a result of the Spirit being evident in the life of the community and in the life of the believer. When the fruit of the Spirit is displayed in our lives, it's a sign or result that we are being led by the Spirit of God. Just like the branches of a grapevine uh, have to be connected to the vine to bear grapes, the fruit of the Spirit is evidence of being connected to the Spirit, to Christ, to God. There's also evidence of, in the community of the Holy Spirit's presence is conviction of sin, living right with God, and hard judgment calls that need to be made. These are signs of a Spirit-filled community. So, it's God who gives generously. And the idea that we give generously is dependent on our understanding that God is the one who gives generously to generate generous giving. Do you get that? God is the one who gives generously to generate generous giving. Generosity is born of divine origin, an attitude of heart and mind that reflects the creator. We're made in his image. Born again by the Spirit, born by the sacrifice and blood of Jesus, loved by the Father. So why wouldn't we be surprised that the more we become like him, the more his nature and character are manifest in our communities and lives. More of the Spirit, more fruit, more generosity. More of the Spirit, more gifts. More of the Spirit, more conviction. The issue here isn't just whether you are a generous person or not. The issue is... Are you full of the Holy Spirit? Not whether you've been filled, but are you full? And if you are full, you can expect to act and live like God. In reading through the New Testament, as Ben took us through last week, he talked about the parables, he centered in on Matthew 6 for a while. There. And we know that God wants us to be generous. Don't worry, don't hoard. Gather up your possessions, give them to the poor. We know that we're called to share everything we have with those in need. But who could ever give enough to meet the needs even down our street? Think about that. Who could give enough love or time or money to meet the needs that present themselves every single day? Even kind and selfless people can't do that. Which doesn't bode too well perhaps for the rest of us who know how selfish we really are. Lack of generosity isn't just rooted in tight-fistedness or mean-spiritedness, but actually in fear and often in greed. Consumerism. Ultimately, I want to say that's a, because there's a lack of God in our lives, a lack of God the Spirit in our community. So don't be fearful or mean the scriptures tell us, because of the immense value that God places on your life. Feeling worthless presents us from giving because we don't think our gift matters. It doesn't matter what I do because no one notices me anyway, perhaps. But don't be fearful or mean because God is the provider and he cares infinitely for us and he knows what you need. The work this works in terms of the gifts of the Spirit in the life of a charismatic church. Gift giving is a key to loving and is a manifestation of the presence of God. If there are gifts of the Spirit flowing in your church, it will be an evidence that there is generosity, that God is present. Why? Because people are in the habit of being generous with what God gives them. Charismatic gifts are given to be given. They're not given solely for the benefit of the individual. They're given to be given. You are blessed to be a blessing. You are given finance to give finance. And that makes you look like your father in heaven. That makes you look and sound, feel the environment around you like God. So what's the solution to being fearful about giving, fearful about money? Well, truthfully, it's to be filled with the Spirit. Paul says it in Ephesians 5, verse 18. He says, don't get drunk on wine, but be filled with the Spirit. 
You may be able to point like I can to a moment when you weren't Phil and then you were. Great moment, perhaps in the past, but that's great as a testimony. My question to you is, are you full today? Have you been seeking God this past week to be filled full of him? Because if we are, we will know the joy and freedom of giving. Because it's really a very blessed thing to see the light in someone's face when you give them something. It's more blessed to give, isn't it, than to receive. When I first became a Christian, in the first three months, I had countless experiences of the Holy Spirit. I mean, countless. I thought, well, this is the best thing that's ever happened to me by a country mile. And one of the things that started happening was about three weeks in, I started to give a proportion of my income uh, uh, regularly, without fail. I've still, actually, I've got to say that all these years on, I've not stopped doing that. And part of the benefit of that is the blessing of being able to not just receive, though, like I was recounting those stories earlier, but it's to be able to give. And that habit was formed in me, and I was in those days particularly absolutely rabid, wanting more of God. That hunger and thirst, that heart that was after him that Ben talked about last week. Listen, giving is one of the nine part fruit of the Spirit. And emotions aren't far away when you start to flow in the Spirit in what God has made you to be. It's not whether you're generous, it's whether you're full of the Spirit. Because if you're full of the Spirit, you can expect there to be a manifestation of generosity. I think of different people in my life who, have, particularly lately, have given. I think of one, Catherine Johnson delivered a cake to my house. There were tears in our eyes. A lady called Jackie Green in Nottingham. She cleaned our house and ironed my shirts during Helen's sickness. Uh, Chris Plumley, hope you're well, Chris. Um, he also had a shop downtown in Derby. I went and chose a pair of shoes from him, but I like this other pair, but I could only afford one. When I got home, I discovered he'd put the other two, the other pair in there anyway. Just a generous man brought me to tears. Giving is an activity of the spirit. I was just thinking about Nestor's roast potatoes as well. They always brought tears to my eyes of joy and bliss whenever we went for lunch there. Giving's an activity of the spirit. And it's central to who we are as the people of God. And right in this moment when we are renovating the riverside, I'm standing here today, reno the, the under, it's underway as it were, things are beginning to get ready for builders to come in and change the whole gamut of the thing. And, you know, it, it's kind of, it's a moment of truth for us as a people. We're not an organization in, in terms of some type of profit-making entity. We're the people of God. And if God's not in the midst of his community, then we're the poorer for it. We'll be tighter. We'll be less generous. There'll be less manifestation of the gifts in our midst. I'm bothered about that because I think it's an essential form of discipleship. So turn with me, if you will, to 2 Corinthians chapter 8, and we'll just show you what Paul says about it. And then we're kind of done today. People, I think, were expecting me to just talk a little bit more about what you can and can't do, how much you want me to give, or what. Now I'm saying, let's go past that and leave that to the Holy Spirit to tell you. But just give regularly and consistently. Give proportionately. Don't be tight. Don't be mean spirited. Actually, be full of the Spirit and let the Spirit lead you. The f generosity is a fruit of you being led by God. Let's watch what Paul says. 2 Corinthians Chapter 8, verses 1 to 6 say, Now, brothers and sisters, we want to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. In the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability. Entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people. <laughs> And they exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves first to the Lord. Do you hear that? First to the Lord. They gave themselves to the Lord, asked the Lord what he wanted them to do. And then, by the will of God, also to us, I urge you, people watching this broadcast, to actually give yourselves to the Lord. 
The generosity, the giving, is a result of you hearing what God says. If you're not listening, you'll give what you think you can afford. Now, give in proportion to your income, but are you open for God saying, I want you to give more this month? We've got this faith for 50. Genuinely, it's well within the grasp of a church like ours to achieve such a thing. But what we're after is you being full of the Holy Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. So we urge Titus, just as he had earlier made a beginning to bring also to completion this act of grace on your part. Okay, what's going on? Paul does not begin by referring to the generosity of the churches uh, of Macedonia, northern Greece. He starts instead with the grace which God has given to the Macedonian churches. That grace was the grace of God. Look at verse 1. The grace that God has given the Macedonian. God is the giver of grace. Grace is another word for generosity. In other words, behind the generosity of the uh, poverty-stricken Macedonians is the generosity of God. So Paul is pointing to these guys and saying to the Corinthians, you need to give like these guys. You need to do what they did and seek God first. And then, and this is where Paul begins, this he makes the link and recognizes that Christian generosity is not just linked to an impassioned appeal or Paul's authority. It's tied directly, and Paul doesn't say, do it because I say He's not commanding anybody. He's not saying do it because we need it. The need was apparent. He's saying do it when you've spoken to God and asked him what you're meant to do. Which presupposes that there's a relationship with God sufficient for you to be able to ask him something and hear his response. How's your relationship with God? What's the harmony like right now? Are you close? Could you actually engage in that type of activity, listen to God, and give more than you expected? You see, I think it's dead easy to give the same amount all the time. You've got standing orders and you got just pay the thing off. You know, it's easy to do. Perhaps we never question what it is that we're meant to give anymore. But I want to encourage you to go to God before you give and enjoy what he says to you. So Christian giving then is not a command. The command, if you like, is go to God. Go seek him. Go seek his face. And it's proportionate. Look at verses 10 to 12 for a moment. Just skip there on account of time. Um, here's my judgment about what's best for you in this matter. Last year you were not the first you, sorry, last year you were the first, not only to gift, but also to have the desire to do so. Now, finish the work so that your eager willingness to do, to do it may be matched by your completion of it, according to your means. According to your means. For if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. A lot to say, little time. So... Listen to this. During the previous year, the Corinthian Christians had been the first not only in giving, but desiring to do so. So now Paul urged them to finish the job. So that their doing will keep pace with their desiring. How often have you ever said to your wife, fellas, look, I meant to get you a bunch of flowers. I just, or worse, you did get the bunch of flowers, but they were from the Sainsbury's petrol station. That is a gross error. And if you think it isn't, then you need to talk to the Lord or your wife. So Christian giving is proportionate giving. The eager willingness comes first. So long, as long as that's there, the gift is acceptable in proportion to what the giver has. Remember when Jesus talked about the widow's might? Rich man giving a lot of money into the temple coffers. Uh, widow gives a fraction of it. He said she gave more. Why? Because in proportion, it was much more to her to give that much. It was sacrificial. For this guy, that was just what he had in his wallet. 
Of course, there are times when that when you do give like the widow, you give extra. But you do it because you desire it and you do it because God tells you to. So you are free to ignore appeals made by Ben and I in last week's video. Or you're, you're free to ignore it. As long as you've talked to the Lord. What does it mean to be part of this family? We get to participate. And if you're a church attender rather than a member of the family, then you can take it or leave it because, you know, giving to the church vies with other kind of perhaps finance or in your budget for entertainment. I don't know. But this isn't that. This is a family giving together uh, for what we believe God has led us into. Now, remember that Paul had already talked to the Corinthians and he said in 1 Corinthians 16 verses 1 and 2 that he says, do what I told the Galatians to do. On the first day of every week, each one of you set aside a sum of money and keep it with his income and saving it up. Now, when, when you do that, you are consistently talking to the Lord and you're setting aside finance to give. There's a desire that's now matched by action to enable you to give appropriately when the time comes. And the Holy Spirit will speak to you about how much and when. Generosity is an absolute fruit of you being filled full of the Holy Spirit. The last thing to say is this, in terms of the scriptures. Giving like this for Paul was a hugely significant symbol of his, the prime, one of the primary motivations of his life was that Jew and Gentile understand that they were now one in Christ. In Ephesians, it talks about the mystery. And what, the mystery was that these two that were separate were now one. When you have Gentile Christians having offerings to give to Jewish Christians who were in poverty, the principle was, look, they, these Jewish Christians gave you the gospel, you can give them relief from their poverty because, you know what, you never know. Next year, they might be helping you. They've already given, you give back, you give again. Now, look, you don't give to receive but you, when you do give, you do receive a blessing. You do receive a blessing. There's a blessing in being able to give. That's true for individuals. It's true in families. And it's true across churches. We're not all that used to seeing the latter, where churches support churches. But we do see in our daily life, family supporting family. I think the stretch for us, guys, is that... We not only want to give because it's a right thing to do, but we want to give because it's a, it's a theological statement. When you give into the life of the church, you're declaring that I am part of one body. And you're saying, I belong. It's not geographical, people from Belper giving into the center people from Leicester or Nottingham or Malaga or North Africa, and they get the money and the money goes in. It's not that. You're declaring something theological. It's a revelation that says, I'm part of the one body of Christ. It's not economical. It's not from rich people to poor people. It's not about geography. It's not about economics. It's about theology in the end. What do you believe? Paul appeals on that basis, I think it gladdened his heart. So in conclusion, what's the question? The question you might be thinking I was going to ask was, are you generous? But that's not the question for today. The question for today is, are you full of the Spirit? The question for our church is, is there space for the Spirit to move? Because if there is, we'll see a rise in the tide of the gifts of the Spirit again. Some of us have lived through days when the presence of God was so thick in our church, it was difficult to breathe, it felt. Conviction of sin, repentance, all these Bible phrases, Bible words, are contingent on us recognizing that God gives.
And that's who we are. Let's pray. Father, I pray in Jesus' name for my friends, for my family out there, Lord, who will be watching this. Wish I could see them. Soon I will. But I pray in the name of Jesus that you would touch our hearts and adjust us slightly, Father, so that we are able to say, I want more of God. It is about the heart. It is about being full. So, Lord, help us to be generous because it's a knack. it would be a demonstration that we were full of the fruit of the Spirit. Here as we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless.